What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick here with Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. We got a real good episode for you today. We're getting into my top three breakout candidates for 2017 fantasy football. It's gonna be a good one because I put a lot of time into this one. There's a lot of information. I'm gonna hit you with some solid points. Now, it was gonna be six guys, but three of them I already covered in my sleeper video, which I'll link here. And I don't wanna get repetitive and keep doing the same dudes, even though, you know, those are the guys I love this offseason. And I'm not gonna change up the names just for the sake of putting out more video content. But I like them going into the season. Those are gonna be my guys that I hammer all summer, right? Anyways, these are three new guys that I haven't touched on. They're middle of the pack guys, you know, they're good, they've had some success, but this is the year that I think they really break out and hit that like elite level of fantasy, you know, they're RB1s, wide receiver ones, and they're going to be some league winners that you get middle late rounds that kind of propel you into the fantasy playoffs and hopefully to the chip. And as always, thank you to Monster, our sponsors for this beautiful video driven by this energy drink. They're not actually our sponsors, but I'll keep saying that until they sponsor me. Fantasy football industry is a great industry to start marketing into. Untapped potential for you monster reps. Pick me up. Also, yo, I got these sweatpants shorts yesterday. Cut off here. Best buy I've ever had. Things are comfortable. They're like, I don't have to wear gym shorts around the house no more, but I don't have to go full sweatpants when it's summer mode. Gorgeous. I would very highly suggest it to anyone. And don't forget, if you enjoy the video, please give it the thumbs up, share, subscribe to the channel if you are new. That keeps me motivated to keep going. It gets more people onto the channel and it helps me grow. So I'm done with the plugs. I'm done advertising. Let's get into the numbers. As I mentioned before, the three dudes that would have been on this list but aren't in my sleeper list, Doug Baldwin, Terrell Pryor, Cameron Meredith, if you were wondering, again, you can go watch the sleeper video. Number one on this list, and this is in order of where their ADP currently is, where they're being picked in drafts. First one on my list is Julio Jones. You may or may not have heard of him. No, I'm just fucking. So first on my list is Amir Abdullah, the running back for the Detroit Lions, currently going 63rd overall as running back 24. The Lions second round pick in 2015. I loved this dude coming out of Nebraska. When I watched his film, I was like, he is going to be an absolute stud in the NFL. I think he brought the entire package. He's very similar to Christian McCaffrey in terms of his skill set. What happened was he came into the league on the Lions. They had an awful, awful, awful offensive line. He didn't get a lot of opportunity. He didn't get the touches to really be a workhorse there. And uh, those two things coupled together just didn't, you know, it, it paired out to be an, an average mediocre rookie season. The flashes of talent were definitely there. He had some big plays and he looked really good at times, but just the offense as a whole really held him back. And 2016, I'm going to say luckily for us, luckily for me, Abdul suffered this foot injury and he only played in two games in 2016. Because of that injury, the, the mediocre rookie year, the injury in the second year cost him a lot of games. Now his ADP is shooting down to, like I said, RB24. So he's being picked as an RB2 slash RB3. And in my eyes, he's a high-end RB2 with RB1 upside in fantasy this year. Now there's a lot of arguments to be made from the opposing side. If you don't like Abdullah, you're staying away from him this year. And I want to break down each and every one of them for you. One, the lack of opportunity. Will he really be the workhorse? Two, injury concerns. Is he injury prone? Three, poor offensive line. Four, Theo Riddick eating up all the backfield receptions, just being that third down back there, limiting Abdullah's PPR upside. So we'll start at number one, what I said, lack of opportunity to feature back in that role. So you look at the Lions offseason, right? They chose not to draft a running back. They chose not to sign one via free agency. And I think actions speak louder than words in that. Clearly, they are comfortable with their backfield right now between Abdullah and Riddick, and then Zenner kind of splitting a little bit of the load there. So that shows how much faith they have in Abdullah there as a running back to not take anyone. After having one of the worst ground games in the NFL last year, they did nothing to improve it this offseason. Abdullah proved throughout all of college that he can handle a workload. His sophomore, junior, senior seasons, he averaged 281 touches in each of those seasons. He was clearly the featured back there in Nebraska, and he's shown that he can handle that workload. And lastly, there was a report that I saw in Roto World that the Lions website had posted on their official website that they expect Amir Abdullah to have a featured role in the Detroit offense in 2017. Now, I'm not gonna take that for exactly what it is, but if the team is suggesting that that's gonna be a big part of their offense, I'm not gonna, you know, what, what in that offense says to you that he won't? 
There's no way that Zach Center's gonna have a feature role. Theo Riddick has proven that he's a terrible running back in terms of being on the ground. He's a very good pass catcher, but that leaves a lot of carries and a lot of opportunity for Amir Abdullah to get all the early down work and a lot of the goal line work. So lack of opportunity, I argue that he's already shown that he can handle a big workload and that there's nothing else there. No free agents, no rookie running backs to take anything away from him. So clearly the Lions had faith in him going into this year. Number two, the injury concern. Is he injury prone? No, he's not. The NFL has, has a big recency bias. What has happened lately? That's who you are in this league. We've recently found out that it was a Liz Frank foot tear injury that Abdullah has, which we've seen hurt players, but we've also seen athletes come back from it. This is the same thing Kevin Durant had and people are like, oh, his career's done. Seen athletes not come back from it well, but Abdullah's near 100%. All the reports say he's ready to roll. He'll be full go for training camp. So as long as the reports say he's fully healthy, why would you just suggest that he's not gonna be ready to go? Doesn't make sense to me. So I'm okay with him being ready for 2017, fully ready, healthy to go. Otherwise, he wouldn't be on this list, obviously. So is he injury prone? No, he played every single game in college, sophomore, junior, senior year, handling that full 281 touches per season workload. Rookie season, full 16 games, no injuries. Last year was that first injury. That's the only thing most people are going off of, and they wrongly assume he's injury prone because of last year's injury. The four years prior to that, handling a big workload, no injuries. No way freaking heck that I'm putting Abdullah as injury prone. He's my freaking boy. To the third point, their poor offensive line. Can any running back be successful behind Detroit's line? That's a good question, but Detroit has improved this offseason, right? They're no Dallas, they're no Oakland, but they had two key additions, and I want to read this off for you. They added right guard TJ Lang and right tackle Ricky Wagner this offseason. Both players finished inside Pro Football Focus's top 10 ranking of pass blocking and top 20 overall. So big, big upgrades at those positions for the Lions, which should definitely boost Abdullah's play and Abdullah's patience and, and timing behind that line. This is gonna be big for him. It'll be by far the best Detroit line that Abdullah has been able to run behind. And that being said, they've had an awful offensive line last few years and Abdullah still managed to be able to put up 4.3 yards per carry, which is a respectable number behind a really bad line. You look at a guy like Latavius Murray, you can only manage four yards a carry behind Oakland's offensive line when all the other guys in the backfield are averaging 5.5, 5.6 yards per carry. And the other guys in Detroit's backfield, Zenner and Theo Riddick, were averaging like 3.7, 3.8 yards per carry. So Abdul is clearly a step up there in the run game. These additions to the line are gonna be big for him. The fourth and probably most concerning point here is Theo Riddick as the pass catching back, right? Riddick's still gonna be the guy in this role. He caught over 50 balls last year. He caught over 80 balls, or I think he caught 80 balls in 2015. So he's gonna be that role. He's gonna play a big part in that role. But Abdullah is very, very, very athletic and is more than capable enough to catch passes himself. As per Pro Football Focus, Abdullah finished in the 89th percentile or better in the vertical jump, broad jump, three cone drill, 20 yard shuttle, and 60 yard shuttle culminated in a collective 98th percentile spark score. What does that mean? He's a freak. And over the last three years, the Lions ranked second in targets, receptions, and receiving yards by running backs. They're tied for the league lead with 17 receiving touchdowns by the position. So even if Theo Riddick eats at that position, there is room for Abdullah to take a nice portion of that from him. He's super athletic, really good receiver coming out of the backfield, underrated in that aspect of the game, and they can definitely use him rather than taking him off the field for Riddick if they don't think that's the right move. All in all, I think there's plenty of opportunity to go around in the backfield um, as a receiver. Again, in his rookie season, Abdullah caught 25 balls, which is by no means a, a big number, but you would definitely expect that number to jump up a little bit and even itself out between Riddick catching 80, Abdullah catching uh, 25, you know, it, Take 15 from Reddick, give 15 to uh, to Abdullah, and boom, 40 receptions is, a, is great to pile on to er, an early down workload. Now, Zach Zenner is their big guy, and he got a lot of goal line touches last year, but I really only think that that was the case because Abdullah was out. I don't think he's a better runner. I don't think he's like that much more powerful. I think they give Abdullah a chance to rush some of those those plays inside the five yard line. So I don't see Zenner playing a big role there. All right, so that's breakout candidate number one. We move to number two, another running back. Blah, 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 blah. Powell out of New York, the New York Jets, currently going 72nd overall, running back 26. It would be pretty easy for me to argue that Powell has the highest ceiling of anyone on this list. Obviously, the key factor here is that he's sharing the backfield with Matt Forte. Now, Matt Forte is gonna be 32 this season, coming off of knee surgery. Just didn't look good down the stretch last year, and uh, it's safe to say he's on his last legs. 
And I don't think people understand just how good Blau Powell was last season when the Jets finally gave him that full workhorse load. So over the team's final four games, when Powell finally, you know, got handed the keys, he was averaging about 26 touches a game, 138 total yards per game, and he scored three times in those four games. And it's worth noting that they won two of those games, two of four, and they only won five games on the season. So in two of the games that he was the workhorse, they were able to win two of their five games. So it says to me that they're a better team when they do that. And I mean, I, I don't really expect the Jets coach is to play to win, but if you know if they want to do something crazy and actually try to win ball games, they might do that. Plus, you got to think it's a rebuilding year. You know, like what they're throwing away all their vets. What's the point of keeping like of feeding Forte when you could see what you have in this young running back in Powell, right? And not to mention, over that four game span that I just talked about, he was running back number two in fantasy over the last four weeks of the season, behind only David Johnson. So obviously, the Jets' offensive coordinator John Morton. Great name, great generic name. Came out this offseason and said they're going to use a running back by committee. Like, obviously, what's he going to be like? No, Forte and his $4 million salary going to sit on the bench. He's useless. Like, that's what they're going to say, of course. But most people expect Powell to take over the majority of the workload there in New York. You have ESPN's Rich Semini. Fully expects Powell to be the starter in New York. Powell's 28 years old. He offers more than Forte on the ground. He offers more than Forte through the air. Powell actually finished with the fourth most receptions by any running back in 2016. He had 58 catches. Uh, the one knock I would say is Forte probably will remain the goal line back. He had 71.4% of the Jets carries inside the five yard line last year. He was actually pretty pretty good at that. If you remember, he had a lot of goal line scores, the one yard line scores, and that's why he was actually useful in fantasy last year. And I don't expect that really to knock off unless he's injured. But the, the overall problem or the overall you know question here is how much of Forte's workload is gonna go over to Powell this year? Is it really gonna be a changing of the guard? And I'm not sure that actually really matters as long as Powell has the majority of it, right? So the Jets offense sets up well for Powell. You look at their team last year, right? They were five and 11, which means that they were definitely trailing for a large majority of their games. They're down in points. You're not gonna be running the ball a lot when you're down in points. They still managed to have the 13th most rushes per game with 26. At five and 11, you're trailing a lot, but they still committed to the ground game. You know, they want to run the ball and that says a lot going into this year. I think they're gonna continue to try to uh, hone in on that philosophy. And even if they don't, Powell is that pass catcher there. Like I said, 58 catches last year. If they don't want to run the ball a lot, he's going to be the guy that they dump the ball off to. Quincy Inunua came out and said, John Morton's offense is predicated on getting the ball out fast. They're going to be a lot of quick passes, which is another positive for the running back. So there could be a ton of dump off opportunity for Powell here. So even if he doesn't win the job outright, he has standalone value, a lot of standalone value by himself and should be a legitimate RB2 in fantasy by himself. And he's getting picked RB26, 72nd overall. I think he's getting picked at his floor. There's only upside where in his value right now. And if Forte, like I said, coming off knee surgery, 32 years old, if he goes down with an injury, Powell is an instant RB1. It instantly gets goes into the top 10, top eight as a position. I think he's one of the steals of the draft this year. So number three breakout candidate for 2017, wide receiver. We had two running backs. We're gonna move over to San, uh, Los Angeles. The Rams, uh, not the Rams. God damn, Nick, get it, pull it together. Let me take a sip of Monsters. Woo! Los Angeles Chargers, baby. Tyrell Williams, Tyrell, Tyrell, whatever you call him. Tyrell Williams, a wide receiver for Phillip Rivers in Los Angeles. Currently getting picked 114th overall's wide receiver 50. Insanity. A lot of this analysis and a lot of this upside is coming from the very recent news of their number seven overall pick, Mike Williams, a wide receiver, herniated disc back injury. Obviously they drafted Williams to be a stud on the outside. This back injury is gonna be very, very costly to him and his progression as a rookie receiver. Now he suffered the injury in the first day of rookie camp. Hasn't played since and has been ruled out until training camp at the very least. That's not a good sign if you don't even have a somewhat of a timetable on this guy coming back. Remember, training camp doesn't start till later in, this, in the off season. This period for rookies to develop timing, to develop chemistry with not just quarterbacks, but teammates is a really big part in their progression. So you look at these other first round rookies in the past few years, First round picks, you know, hyped up, talented guys that have had these offseason injuries. And just listen to this list of names. So it's guys like Brashad Perriman, Josh Doxson, 
Kevin White. Clearly the injuries were bad news for them and I think it's going to be the same for Mike Williams because this is a key part of their development. Ports just came out from Coach Anthony Lynn to acknowledge a first round pick. Mike Williams is getting behind due to so much time with a back injury. Like you need to learn the playbook, you need to develop the timing, a lot of this. But anyways, let's get back to Terrell Williams. Who is Terrell Williams? Who this guy? Who do you think you stinking that you stunting on? That man. So now Williams has the opportunity. It's there for him. He's going to be that wide receiver on the outside. And I think it's going to be a big, big year for this guy. So he already proved it in 2016 that he's capable of having a big year. A lot of people probably don't know this, but he was wide receiver 11 in fantasy last year. Like overall for the entire season, wide receiver 11. And in standard leagues, in standard leagues, his PPR finishes were a little a little lower, but still top 15, top 17, I think it was for PPR. That's some low key good stuff right there. He caught 69 balls, had 1,059 yards and scored seven times. Williams is a big dude. He's 6'3", 6'4", 205, 207 pounds. So like a really nice prototypical build for a wide receiver on the outside. And he's got blazing speed for that size. He runs a 4'4". 840. Williams ranked 89th percentile on burst, 82nd percentile on agility, 98th percentile on catch radius, huge by the goal line, and 83rd percentile spark score. Now these numbers don't always translate into the NFL. You know, I don't want to be the one to like put pin things on that because we've seen like the Kevin Weiss and stuff, but we saw it translate last year. So why would you think it's going to be any different? He had a big year last year and it's shown that his athletic ability has translated into the NFL. He averaged 15.3 yards per reception. So among guys that had at least 95 targets last year, he was fourth in the NFL with that. Only behind Julio, T.Y. Hilton, Marvin Jones. He was tied for 14th in the NFL with a team high eight targets inside the opponent's 10 yard line aka the 10 zone. Not only is he a legitimate deep threat, his yards per reception say so, his size is big down by that goal line. He had eight targets inside the 10 yard line. He is the guy on the outside there for the Chargers. They pass a lot and they're gonna look his way when they're near the end zone. Now, it's gonna be difficult for him to repeat his 115 targets that he had from last year. Um, because Keenan Allen's returning, obviously. But he is the first option on the outside. My best estimate says he will definitely have 100 targets again, if not more than that. He could shock us and, and you know, turn into an elite wide receiver, which would not definitely not shock me if he had, you know, 115, 125 targets next year. So as I said, this injury to Mike Williams is going to kill his progression. He's not, he has a big uphill battle to climb to get playing time now to be like an actual threat and a real receiver on this team, coupled with Williams being a very good deep threat and his size and athleticism just you know he's a possession receiver he's a good by the goal line that catch radius is great for fades for whatever you want whatever route you want him to run he could do it for you so he has a huge ceiling here there's not much there's not much downside I like what downside could you see here as being the number one outside guy with height athleticism speed deep ball, goal line like all those targets man like what what downside do you see at wide receiver 50 114 overall it's Come on. So he's probably my favorite pick outside of the top 100 current ADP. And I think he could legitimately finish as a wide receiver two in fantasy this year. So given that, he's one of the best values in the draft right now. So that wraps up my top three breakout candidates. I hope that was informative. Hope it was valuable. I hope I changed your minds and got you thinking. Go ahead and, and list down below some of your favorite breakout candidates. I have a feeling they're going to be guys like John Brown, Stefan Diggs. I can't really think of any other off the top of my head, but I feel like those are going to be some of the top guys. And I want to know what you guys think about these guys and if you think they're going to break out. And if not, why not? Because I feel like I, I battled a lot of the points that you would say against them. But anyways, if it was good, please give it the thumbs up again. Share, subscribe if you're new to the channel. We'll be giving out good fantasy football info all off season. This has been linked below the whole time, so go follow us on Twitter and go check out the blog. These are all posted in blog form. Get the newsletter for all updates. Big dogs gotta eat style. Oh, also, if you're looking for any fantasy football gear, talking draft board kits, comes with a draft board, all the player labels, koozies for your league members, or championship belts, rings, trophies, any of that kind of stuff, I got an affiliate link for fantasyjocks.com. They have the highest quality products in the market. I can guarantee you that. Go check it out. Everything is linked below that I talk about. Thank you for spending your time with me. I, I appreciate it. I'll see y'all next time. Peace.